Well, I think the first thing is um, it's certainly the biggest mistake I see people making is what I would affectionately call the premature ask. The premature ask is kind of like, you know, you've just moved into a new apartment and the next door neighbor comes by and says, wow, I love that stereo I just saw you carrying up the walk. I can't wait to borrow that. You know, in that moment, you're probably rolling your eyes back in your head saying, oh, who did I move in next door to? But you see this in business networking all the time, right? You, mm -hmm. At any given networking event, usually the most influential person in the room is the guest speaker on stage, right? And that person will walk off stage and there'll literally be a lineup of people waiting to speak to them. And, and half of them will be wanting to offer to buy them a coffee or a lunch. And the other half will be wanting to give them some kind of product sample, a book, a CD, or some sample of their product. And all of those gestures are more about the person who's doing the asking. Welcome to the Secrets of Success podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ken Keyes. Well, today's interview with Teresa is amazing. I've known Teresa for many years through the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers, and she's now carved out a life of hers where she hangs out down south in Costa Rica for the winter months in Canada, but also the summer months up here. But one of the things that Teresa has now become a global expert is just this whole area of influence. Now, you know, it's interesting how maybe some of you have been listening and said, well, listen, the influence doesn't apply to me. But the reality is, is all of us are trying to influence other individuals around us. And what's interesting as we get into the In inner calm, grounded, is just centered. her take on the fact that having a lot of influence is not about taking it's really about giving i mean this even goes back to the book that adam wrote on give and take and so and teresa grew up in a um, large family nine kids in northern canada remote community and now here she has this sort of international group of influencer that's influencers that she now leads but her story she starts as, as a environmental engineer and then moves into this high, whole area of, of business influence, management, and leadership. Now, as always, we thank you for listening. If you like what we're doing, just you know, pass it on, leave a positive comment, share uh, you know, whatever platform that you're on. And if you do have any feedback, love to hear from you. you know, when I hear from listeners in that you've been listening, so listen, Ken, we've been listening for a year. Uh, we haven't said anything, but really enjoy it. You know, it is helpful for me as a host and certainly rewarding that we are doing something um, transformational for you and hopefully do our best as a host to draw out of insights and thoughts and stories that will transform your life. Now, CRG hosts or sponsors this show and I mean that's our assessment company and my encouragement to you if you already haven't done so that you know maybe you have already that two of our most popular tools is the personal style indicator, uh, you know, in our opinion, and also the opinion of participants, the number one personality assessment in the world. And the second assessment, which is our second most popular tool, is the values preference indicator. And I just finished doing a workshop with 150 people, 140 people packed in the room, and they just said, this is the most transformational 90 minutes of my life so that I can now make the right decision every, every time. So my encouragement is we have two e-courses, one for the personal style and one for the values preference in that if you've already taken it great maybe share that link with somebody that you know so that they could take this transformational piece you know because my purpose our purpose is to help others to live lead and work on purpose and that's one of the things that Teresa says in this interview if you're really kind of struggling with identity and who you are and happiness which we all do myself included then can we lean in to what it is that we are called to do and if we don't know what that is can we clarify that and that's what our tools and resources do so again thank you for listening and here is our guest Teresa and as a dyslexic person I actually get Teresa to say her last name in the beginning of the interview so uh, here it is and we have all the links for you in our free book and everything as you go through this episode Thanks for listening. Here's your episode of Secrets of Success. Welcome to the Secrets of Success podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ken Keyes. 
Well, today's interview is a little unique because our guest has moved to the south, to the Caribbean region, we're going to say that, to Costa Rica. And because things are warm there, she's getting a new pool put in. And now she's headed over to the local cafe. So when you hear dishes in the background today during her recording, that's because she's just enjoying a coffee with several hundred of her close friends. So welcome to the show. Now, Teresa, I'm going to get you to say your last name just so that it's set correctly for the audience, Teresa. So how do you say your last name correctly? It's Teresa de Grosbois, and thank you so much for having me, Ken. Well, you're welcome, Teresa. And we've known each other for a long time through the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers, but we haven't chatted for a while. And so thank you very much for being on the show. And by the way, uh, folks, Teresa is a number one bestseller. She's a high-level influencer in the professional development field. And so we'll have all kinds of fun today during our interview. So, uh, Teresa, to kind of get going, as you said, you know, before we started to record, your heritage has this French background. So where did Teresa, where were you born and, and where did you grow up? Well, I originally hail from northern Canada, actually, northern Ontario to be precise. Um, in fact, I grew up in a pretty rural setting. We used to spend our summers in a remote backwoods cabin. We'd go in by boat every year. And that was my, uh, my first introduction to influence. In other words, I had none. <laughs> So it was kind of an interesting grounding for someone who's fascinated by the topic. Absolutely. And so what did your family do up north there? Well, in fact, my, my dad was a doctor in a, in a remote rural setting. And so, you know, he just loved the wilderness. So he packed the whole family off to the cabin every summer. And then he would go back to the town where he worked um, midday and come back on the weekends. It was really quite fun. Wow, wow. So then after, after um, now did you finish all your sort of high school years in that community? I did, and then I eventually ended up um, first going to university in northern Ontario, and then I moved west. So I've spent the last 30 years in western Canada, um, but I'm, uh, I'm what they might call a snowboard, snowbird. I commute south in the winter times, and I spend my winters in Costa Rica. And how did Costa Rica get on to your... Um, radar map to as a place to kind of hang out with in the in the winters well i'd love to say i picked costa rica but really costa rica picked me <laughs> you know i uh, i'm one of these people that that really believes if um if the same thing keeps happening happening to you over and over again you really should start paying attention and i had numerous people in the space of about six months all keep saying to me geez we should do something in costa rica we should create a community down in costa rica we should create a retreat center down in costa rica and they were literally all saying Costa Rica, like not some random Caribbean country, literally Costa Rica. And uh, so I thought, okay, if the universe is going to be going to whack me about the head with this idea, I better pay attention. And uh, we came down to Costa Rica and very quickly um, the idea of creating an intentional community that's all about not only living sustainably, but living consciously. In other words, in success-based principles, um, develop very rapidly. So we're having a lot of fun with that down here. Now, how long have you uh, been down there as far as doing this? Now, do you still go to Calgary periodically? Do you have a house there? Yeah, yeah I still spend uh, all of my uh, summer months, or what would be Canadian summer, up in Canada, usually uh, moving between Calgary and Vancouver and Toronto, and sometimes the East Coast as well. Um, but I, my main home, home is where the heart is, is actually down in Costa Rica right now. So we have a, we have a beautiful community being developed down here called Vista Mundo, and it's been developed by a number of the members of the Evolutionary Business Council, which of course I run. And um, it's pretty cool what uh, what's happening. It's not a one person owns the whole thing kind of paradigm. It's more a group of colleagues collaborating to see what we could develop that would be different. Mm. Well, it's interesting because there's other individuals in our space that are moving in the area, not Costa Rica's per se, but uh, I was just on a podcast. I was recorded a year ago and the individual's from Vancouver and he's in Costa Rica now. Uh, but uh, we also had Brendan Bouchard move to Puerto Rico. So there seems to be, that area seems to be drawing some individuals that are in our development space to kind of hang out there 
uh, as a place to live. So what do you think is the attraction yeah. to kind of hang out there? Well, you know, I'm, I, I mean, other than it's absolute paradise, <laughs> but, you know, I am noticing there are thousands of retreat centers and um, thousands of people with um, ideas for transformational businesses um, starting up down here. So it's quite interesting to see. Of all the Central Americas, though, I do love Costa Rica the best because it's not only got um, – beautiful oceans and amazing beaches it's also got mountains so there's the opportunity for a perfect climate here because as soon as you get up uh, at a little bit of elevation the, the temperatures are always in those just perfect zones where you don't need air conditioning or central heating so you can live very indoor outdoor which i just adore mm -hmm. well being an indoor outdoor guy i get that for sure so teresa we're going to digress a little bit and one of the things about secrets of success is we really want to learn about the person and their journey. So the question I have for you, Teresa, is like after high school, what, what's, where did you go? Like you said you went to college. What did you take? Well, you know, I'd love to say I, I had a really beautiful linear path to where I am now. Uh, I would have to say anything but, you know. My, uh, my first education was in the realm of biology and, and physical science. By the time I, uh, I did my master's degree, I started a, a really beautiful career in the environmental sciences, but that very, very quickly took me into environmental management systems, which took me into having uh, a lot of expertise in just management systems in general, which ended up having me become an expert in business of all things. Like to, to jump from biology to business seems like a long leap, but it actually wasn't really that far. And um, Somewhere along the line, I ended up being one of the top authorities in the world and understanding how business management and, and business structures should operate. And, uh, and that sort of became the launching ground for more of a career in the influence realm. It was kind of interesting how that evolved. Mm. Now, uh, when you were doing, doing this, were you mostly living in the Calgary area or what was sort of the, where did home sort of end up for you for most of this? Yeah, for much of that period, home was Calgary, uh, working in the oil and gas industry in Canada, actually. And I, I worked on both sides of the fence, both as a government employee for periods and also uh, leading big initiatives for industry. So I had an interesting and varied career leading big change initiatives, which really helped me get grounded in hmm, how do grassroots movements really work and, and how does influence really work. It was actually an interesting way to... Uh, to learn some very basic concepts, but what I really found was I was applying a lot of the knowledge I was gaining to stuff I wasn't super passionate about, you know, so after about 20 years of doing that, I finally decided, oh, I got to do, you know, now for something completely different and, um, and really rethink my life because life's too short to not really be juiced up when you get up every morning. Mm. So what do you think contributed to the shift? And then uh, for the listeners purposes, what did you shift to? You know, I think the biggest thing that um, contributed to the shift was I had what I now affectionately call my really, really bad year. You know, I had a year where my whole life started falling apart. You know, my, my business at the time failed, my marriage fell apart, my dad had passed away, and my health was in an utter tailspin, you know. And wow. I had um, a specific moment, you know, where I was sitting on the bathroom floor, believe it or not, of my new condo post-marriage breakup. And I've always been a renovator, so, you know, this bathroom was going to be my latest project. And I'm, I'm sitting there looking at all these tools sitting around me, literally in tears. And the only thought in my head in that moment was, it's me that needs renovating. You know, I have all the outward trappings of success. I've had this beautiful six-figure income. I've got the nice house. I've got two kids. I've got what others people would look at and say is an amazing, highly successful career, and I cannot remember the last time in my life that I was really turned on happy, you know. And, and that was such a beautiful moment because it was the moment I decided to make me my next project. You know, so at that, at that juncture, I started doing every self-help course I could get my hands on. I started getting a lot more serious about my yoga, my health, I, I went back and did a whole certificate in mediation because I, I realized conflict avoiding was a big problem for me. But that was the beginning of some pretty major shift in my life. You know, within a year of that, I had 
left my other profession. I had started a, a charity to, uh, to help build schools in Africa. I had started writing books to raise money for the charity. And, um, and everything was shifting in my life. That was, I would say, the beginning of, of sort of Teresa 2.0. Mm. Well, Teresa, you know, you know as, a, as a podcast, our number one focus is to really help the listeners have insights. And thanks for being authentic and real in that area. But one of the questions I have for you, Teresa, is that what would you say to other people who are going through the same thing? They really have their doubts. I mean, our work at CRG now is around, you know, helping others to live, lead, and work at purpose. And the Secrets of Success podcast gives insights from experts like you. But what would you say to somebody who is like in the middle of this, maybe not the worst year of their life, but they're in the middle of this right now. What would you say to them or encourage them about the steps to take as you did? Well, I would say, you know, I love how Sheryl Sandberg puts it, talking about leaning in, you know. Because sometimes it's the utter collapse of everything we know that is necessary for us to really look at, Jesus, our life really the life that we wanted, you know? And sometimes it's all it takes is, is to start leaning in the direction of what actually lights you up and makes you happy, you know? I love how um, Aristotle first started talking about the different types of happiness, right? Like this is thousands of years ago, one of our earliest philosophers talked about that there was a distinction between hedonistic happiness, you know, the, the happiness that comes from, you know, petting a dog or uh, having a really nice latte or eating a nice piece of chocolate cake, things we might call pursuits of the flesh, right? And not inappropriate forms of happiness. Mm -hmm. But they're very distinct from what he called eudaimonia, right? Or eudonistic happiness is the happiness that comes from knowing that you're a really deep contribution to your family, to your community, to the world at large. And when you really feel like your life is about something, that your life is a contribution to society, then your happiness is more settled into your bones and it's a lot more lasting, right? So, you know, the interesting thing about that is really making your life about something bigger, more than just the paycheck, more than just being a good provider or having a nice house, is actually the best thing you can do for your own happiness. You know, so figuring out what, what is that thing that you, you would really shift in the world is actually the first step to leaning into a really turned on, tuned in life that where you just feel like every morning is worth getting up and, and you know, you just want to take the world by storm. And thank you, Teresa, for that. What would you say to the individuals who are listening that, and I'm not saying there's even many that are like this, but they actually don't know where to start. So you say lean in and, you know, obviously at CRG we have roadmaps for that, but I'm curious about your thoughts about if, you know, where do I lead in, lean in? If, if I've really not done this work before, where might I start? Well, I would say notice certain things. Like, so the first thing to notice is if you frequently say, why doesn't somebody just, you know, and whatever the finish of that sentence is, if, if there's something you really wish was different in the world, that's the first clue to what your mission in life would be. Your mm -hmm. second clue is if you ever find yourself saying, someday when I am blank, I will. You know, mine used to be someday when I'm influential enough, I'd love to start an organization that really helps grassroots change agents figure out how influence works, that really helps them to support creating shift and movement in the world which, go figure, ended, ended up being the Evolutionary Business Council, which I lead, right? But I had to have actually other colleagues point out to me, Teresa, do you notice that you're saying, someday when I'm influential enough, I will. And by the way, you teach people to notice when they say, someday I will. So if you start noticing those two things, what's your why doesn't somebody just, and what's your someday I will, those are some of your biggest clues to what's mm. that place where you would really love to be a high contribution to the world and it would actually really light you up to go there, I would invite you to make someday today and just courageously jump in. I love it. I love it, Tree. Now, let's just back up for a second. And you said, I've progressed from biology into being this business management expert. You know, before we get into sort of the space that you're now, how, how did that occur? And what are some of the things that you learned around management and leadership that 
um, we can share with the audience that can benefit them? Well, I think one of the earliest concepts I learned, uh, which is from, when, was from one of my earliest mentors, was, you know, push the rope in the middle, right? Like, if you want to create change in the world, you know, find those few people that love what you're up to and run like hell, and, and eventually the ends will follow, right? And that concept has really served me well in life. You know, when I first made that shift of just, you know, okay, what if my life looked completely different, what might I do? You know, starting a charity and starting to write some books to raise money for the charity, that was me leaning in. But that very quickly taught me, A, I didn't like running a charity, and B, um, I had dozens of people coming at me saying, Teresa, three bestsellers in eight months? How did you do that? And would you show me how? And I ended up mentoring all these people who didn't understand how word-of-mouth epidemics get started. They didn't understand the basic principles of how influence works. And it, it's kind of like, you know how fish don't know what water is. Often we're really good at something, and, and we don't realize we're really good at it because it's just it's the water we swim in, you know. I didn't realize I was a master at understanding how influence works until all these people were asking me to explain it to them, you know. And one of the reasons I wrote Mass Influence the habits of the highly influential was because I was finding good people like everyday heroes that just really wanted to create grassroots change and grassroots initiatives and they didn't understand the basic principles of how easy it is to become influential if you just understand the way the influential operate so it really became a passion of mine to help people who just want to create change in the world understand how to get there and how to get there simply mm. Well, let's let's jump into that because I think I'm curious, of course, just to hear some of the some of these things where he said, "Well, it's pretty straightforward, but many people are not doing it or doing it successfully in terms of uh, influencing. They want to, but they're unable to." So, what can you teach us from your uh, from your book around mass influence? And I think you know all of us want to influence somebody in some level or, or another, uh, just probably different elements. What, what are some of the things you were teaching these other experts? Well, I think the first thing that is worth getting related to is, is knowing that influence is a skill. You know, in fact, you might even talk about it almost like it's a sport, right? And once you get it, it's one of the most easy things you can ever do, right? Because, you know, I can feel some of your listeners out there. They're going, oh, shoot me in the head. One more thing I have to learn. Where am I going to find the time, right? And influence is actually a lot like breathing, you know, there, there was a time in your life you had to learn how to breathe, right? You came out of that beautiful, warm environment. Some idiot whacked you on the back. You cried for a minute, and then you mastered the skill of breathing. And by and large, you never thought about breathing again. It wasn't something you went through your day going, oh, my God, i got to breathe 24-7 today. Where am I going to find the time, right? And, and unless there were those moments where, where you suddenly realized, oh, there's an advanced level of breathing. Maybe I'm doing karate or, or yoga or qigong and, and there actually is an advanced level of breathing. Breathing isn't something that you normally think about, right? You just do it. Mm. And influence is a lot like that. It's just, you know, we have learned certain paradigms or skill sets like we, you know, starting back in the sandbox, we all learned sort of a tit for tat mindset like I do this for you, you do that for me. And then we, you know, we came into business and we learned things like in networking, it's a good idea to offer to buy a coffee for a colleague or offer to buy them lunch if you want to build relationship. And then suddenly you come into the realm of the highly influential. And, you know, try phoning up the head of a Fortune 500 company and offer to buy them coffee faster than you can say gatekeeper you're going to learn that there's a different set of etiquette and a different set of rules that apply to the highly influential, right? And it's almost like you've learned to play base, uh, basketball or baseball and you're bringing those skills onto the hockey rink and you can't figure out why you're ending up on your butt and everybody's shooting mm -hmm. pucks at you, right? So it's just a, a matter of understanding the way the influence, influential tend to operate and avoiding the mistakes of you know, bringing the wrong sport onto the playing field. So what are some of those specific things that you are teaching people to do that's different or just not necessarily commonly known? I, I get that where you say, you know, you go and connect with somebody and grab a coffee and build a relationship. So when you get into these other stratospheres, what do you do differently? Well, I think the first thing is um, it's certainly the biggest mistake I see people making is what I would affectionately call the premature ask. 
you know, and everybody laughs when I said, say that. They always say, the premature what? <laughs> but mm -hmm. the premature ask is kind of like, you know, you've just moved into a new apartment and the next door neighbor comes by and says, wow, I love that stereo I just saw you carrying up the walk. I can't wait to borrow that. You know, in that moment, you're probably rolling your eyes back in your head saying, oh, who did I move in next door to, you know? But you see this in business networking all the time, right? You, mm -hmm. At any given networking event, usually the most influential person in the room is the guest speaker on stage, right? And that person will walk off stage and there will literally be a lineup of people waiting to speak to them and, and half of them will want, be wanting to offer to buy them a coffee or a lunch and the other half will be wanting to give them some kind of product sample, a book, a CD or some sample of their product. And all of those, all of those gestures are more about the person who's doing the asking. They're, they have nothing to do with the speaker on stage. It's kind of the equivalent of going to the new neighbor you just met and saying, oh, you're going to love my kids. You're so going to enjoy babysitting them. You know, and, and that might be true. You might have the best kids on the planet and the neighbors might really love them, but it's just too soon for that conversation, right? If you right. watch the way the influential tend to operate, when an influential person meets another influential person, they make it all about what can I do to help you, not what you can do to help me, you know? And, and so it's important to understand that basic etiquette of approaching the influential. Mm. Yeah, there are so many people that they get sort of anxious in it rather than sort of being in this calm, grounded, centered moment, it is this anxiousness that I better mention something or I'm going to lose the opportunity. But really, in fact, the opposite occurs, doesn't it? Yeah, it really stems from this whole belief of, oh my God, this is my one chance. I better get in there and ask, right? Like we've always heard all those movies where they're like, always be closing, you know, take, seize the day, take the opportunity. But that mindset creates a little desperation, you know? And when you do it right, when you build relationship with some when influential by offering them something first, there's no need to be desperate, right? Mm. The, the better thing to do if you're getting in line to meet someone influential is to walk up and say, hey, I heard you say you were going to be in Chicago next week. I know someone who has a stage there or a podcast there. Can I introduce you? Or, you know, you mentioned that you were looking for other experts in this field. I know someone. Can I introduce you? Or, or can I shout your stuff out on my social media? I, I would love to help you create more energy around you. Or, or can I nominate you for this award? I think you'd be a great recipient for that award. Notice all of those actions, all of those offers are more about giving influence to the person you're trying to meet. They're not all about you. You're going to get a much better in with that person. It's a lot like taking a lasagna or an apple pie to the new neighbor and that's going to kickstart the relationship. There's no need to be desperate in that case. Now you're in relationship. Mm. Now, just for practical purposes, Teresa, and thank you for that, is you created these bestsellers all within this year period of time. Um, how did you do that? What, what were some of the things, you know, from a, I'll call it from a, a, a starting, you know, just a starting point, how did you be able to create that kind of momentum to create these bestsellers? Well, it's really important to understand that a, a best-selling book, just like any product launch, is nothing more than a couple hundred highly influential people all talking about your book all at the same time, right? And so a lot of people are like, wow, how do you create 200 influential people all talking about your book at the same time? Well, the answer is very simple. Create relationship with 200 influential people, right? And, and this is where one of the key skills of highly influential people come in and I, I've got a whole chapter dedicated to this on my book, Mass Influence. Is influential people tend to create reciprocity with, with each other that's not about scorekeeping. In fact, there's a beautiful term that was coined by Dr. Shonda Perrin, who's, who's one of the leading communications experts in North America. She talks about how people create these cycles of reciprocity mm. when they're building relationship and influential people tend to create cycles of reciprocity with each other just by helping each other build influence. Like, so it might be one week, hey, can I interview you on my podcast? The next week, the other person might be offering to shout something out on Facebook. It is not about scorekeeping. It's just about this whole pay it forward type attitude of how do we really, really help each other? In mm -hmm. fact, if you're trying to build relationship with someone who's extremely influential, like if there's a big differential in your influence, 
you know, you might be investing in that relationship for six months, a year, um, before there's enough reciprocity for their, um, you know, for them to invest back in you. And yet it's still worth it to work on it to build up that relationship because the more influential people that have you on your radar, the easier it is for you to launch anything, let alone a book. Mm. When we think about going forward, now you've started this uh, evolutionary business council. Uh, tell us a little bit about it and, and what is the purpose of this uh, group. And then I'm going to have some follow-up questions about what we're learning out of that group. So fire away. Well, the Evolutionary Business Council, we, we like to call it the EBC, is really just a group of people who are difference makers and change agents in the world. And they're all running, you know, impact-based businesses that are aligned with creating a, a more conscious, more sustainable world. And we encourage them to use different forms of education or what you might call education marketing as a primary means to spread the word about what they're doing. So a lot of them are speakers, trainers, podcasters, writers. They all are people who are growing tribes and growing followings, and they tend to mastermind with each other and support each other to make it very, very easy that any one of us can create really big word-of-mouth epidemics around what we're doing. You know, and it's also a really safe space for difference makers to meet and talk about how challenging it can be internally especially, like dealing with our own negative self-talk, our own self-sabotage about really stepping into leadership to create change in the world. Because of course, you know, good people tend to really um, have a lot of self-doubt about their own worthiness to lead when it comes to stepping into their own dreams of really making a big difference in the world. Okay. Well, hang on. Let's just stop there for a minute. I think that's, that's an important concept. Uh, there was a book out, you know, the imposter syndrome, et cetera. Just, just elaborate yeah, a little bit beautiful. more where there seemingly some individuals, hey, we've all been through it, uh, myself included, mm -hmm. uh, where we just say, you know, am I even worthy of this kind of position? So just elaborate on that and how those audience members that are listening might address that concern as well. Yeah, it's fascinating what the research in this area is showing. And it's, in fact, it's showing that um, good people everywhere tend to have the most amount of self-sabotaging thoughts, like negative self-talk, I can't do it, who am I, uh, I'm not big enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not eloquent enough. Everybody's got some brand of this going on. And it flares up the most when we talk about stepping into our own dreams of really being a contribution in the world. You know, and ironically, the only people that tend not to have a lot of self-limiting beliefs like this tend to be sociopaths. Like, they've got an inner dialogue going on, too, but it tends to be very different inner dialogue than normal, healthy people, right? So, really, when good people, everyday heroes, don't learn to step into leadership and really try and influence change in the world, what's at risk is we risk leaving behind a world for our children that's run by the very leaders that we fear, that's one of the reasons the Evolutionary Business Council is so important because we really help everyday good people, everyday leaders realize that stepping into influence is not only easy, stepping into influence is important. So how do we overcome some of these doubts or self-limiting beliefs? What are you teaching others about this? Well, first and foremost, you've got to recognize that you got them. You know, because a lot of people aren't even aware of their own thoughts. You know? When you start to listen to your own thoughts, what are those messages you tell yourself? And especially, what are those messages you tell yourself when you think about stepping into leadership or stepping into influence, right? Because those are usually the situations in which we create not only the most self-doubt, but I would say the most self-terror, right? Like, nobody's going to want to listen to me. I'm going to look bad. I might fail. I might fail spectacularly, you know? So ironically, most of those deepest fears that we have were created by us when we were very, very young, when we were first learning language, you know. Mm. So whatever those first failures we had in life, research shows those become repetitive themes. So, you know, if, you're, if in your earliest failures in life you told yourself that you're going to look stupid or nobody loves you or you're not good at counting or... Um, you're not good at speaking in front of people, whatever those themes were that you created in those earliest failures in your life, those you tend to carry throughout your life, right? So it's, it's important to 
fall in love with your inner child a little bit and know that that youngest version of yourself was just trying to protect you in that, those moments and, um, and really learn to, you know, comfort yourself in those moments. And, you know, I like to say, um, and, and this actually comes out of Jennifer Hoff's work, that, you know, we can give our inner child a new job description. You know, get your inner child cheering you on, not being the inner dialogue that tells you you might fail, that, that it might not work, that you shouldn't move forward. Um, get your inner child being your biggest cheerleader, and that will really start to transform things in your life. Mm. So we notice, we start paying attention. Anything else to kind of break free of some of these limiting things that come our way? Well, I would say the best thing you can ever do for yourself is give yourself permission to fail. In fact, give yourself permission to fail spectacularly because if you're not willing to fail, you will never step into the things that are really meaningful to you. Our dreams are scarier to us than they are to anyone else, you know, because they're your dreams, right? That's huge. And I don't mean your dreams of like owning a nicer sports car, owning a nicer house. Those are appropriate hedonistic dreams. I mean, what's your eudonistic dreams? What are your dreams to actually really be important in the lives of others? You know, because when you think about stepping into those, that's where your self-doubt and your self-sabotage is really going to flare up. Give yourself permission to try stuff and give yourself permission to fail because mm. until you do, you're just dreaming. Mm, for sure. And if I may add, Teresa, is that we conduct a three-day certification around our assessments and tools. And one of the activities Beautiful. we do in the event is we, we have people give and receive feedback. And oddly enough, I can't forget this, but about a decade ago, we had an individual in the room and he said, my number one issue is that I can't, I don't feel comfortable receiving compliments. And uh, just so you know, Teresa, this was a pastor. So when you think about it, he had really not, it's almost like this false humility where if I receive these positive accolades, I've somehow become arrogant and that's not what you're talking about no not at all in fact inability to receive compliments is just a, a symptom of we don't think we're worthy right mm -hmm. and you know there's a big disti distinction between self-confidence and arrogance arrogance is actually usually a mask that we put on to hide how badly we are afraid and we think we're unworthy right Whereas self-confidence is actually stepping into, huh, maybe I'm the best person to do this because there is no such thing as perfect on this planet and I'm going to give this my best shot. And I'm confident that with the help of friends, colleagues, neighbors, that I can do this. Mm. And that's a whole different conversation, right? And you actually need to start to get in touch with your limiting beliefs. I love that exercise, by the way. It's one of the reasons I'm such a big fan of your programs, Ken. Because when we get in touch with what are those deep-seated core beliefs that are getting in our way, inability to receive is just a symptom of some other deep-seated conversation that's probably getting in the way of your leadership as a whole. Hmm. Well, I know I've dealt with it too, just to receive a, a positive compliment. Uh, sometimes what we do is we might even discount it. So, oh, Teresa, it was nothing. Rather than simply receiving it and saying thank you. So even how I respond to the compliment is stating sort of my emotional condition, if I may. Now, Teresa, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, so before we go into some final comments of wisdom from you and maybe some of the stuff that the uh, EBC is doing, uh, how can people uh, find out more about you uh, so that you can influence even more individuals? Well, I'd love to have people um, check out my book. We actually still give the digital version of my book away for free. And there is a 30-day influence challenge. So if you want to learn some of the basic skills of uh, understanding how you know, influence is really just a habit that you can pick up, then come to massinfluencethebook.com and you can sign up for my complimentary program, um, the 30-day influence challenge, and we'll send you to all the sites where you can get the digital version of Mass Influence for free. We, you can download it on Kindle, Kobo, iBooks, uh, wherever you want. And just working through the basic um, exercises involved in understanding how influence really works is going to be a great start 
to move you down the, the path to your own leadership and your own influence. Mm. And I think one of the things you're talking about, Teresa, because really, you know, secrets of success, success, we don't do a lot of uh, sessions around marketing, but when we think about communications, all of us are influencing somebody somewhere, and what you're doing is just giving us really a way to have a platform uh, to make a greater impact as, as part of that. So with that being said, Teresa, what are some... What are some dynamics that have happened in building the Evolutionary Business Council that haven't gone as well as you'd hoped? Uh, things that you've learned, and then well, sort of on the flip side of that is the wisdom that's come out of it. Yeah, you know, the EBC is just a beautiful experiment, right? Because it started with the inquiry of, you know, what if we just pull the change agents of the world together and treat influence more like it's a currency rather than money like it's a currency? You know, what if we just start starting start to get really focused on um, how do we build really big tribes and how do we really help each other with our really big tribes and so it's ever evolving actually it's it's really um, it's one of the coolest things I've ever done and it's also one of the scariest you know because you know I'm I'm a youngest of nine kids who grew up in the backwoods of northern Canada um, you know, a lot of my inner dialogue has been around, I'm too small to play with the big kids, or I'm, I'm too backwards, nobody's going to listen to me, you know. Mm. And um, you can imagine how much that inner dialogue could get in the way when I have to walk out on stage in front of a thousand people and, and um, you know, transform their lives. The interesting thing about the EBC is, you know, it's a group of amazing people. So even when my inner dialogue flares up, like who could ever be big enough to lead an organization of leaders that amazing? The cool thing about leading an organization of amazing leaders is they won't let me fail. You know, there's, there's no ball I could drop. There's no uncertainty I could have. Um, that there isn't a group of amazing people there to help me catch the ball or coach me through the uncertainty. So it's been a really amazing, miraculous journey in my life that, um, I, you know, I'd like to say I can't wait to see how it ends, but I actually think it's um, an organization with a lot of roots that's going to have longevity way beyond my own life. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that, Teresa. Now, as we uh, wrap up this interview, what would be sort of your final encouragement or words of wisdom to the listeners so that they could really take their life to the next level? You know, I would have to say just step into your dreams, play big, give yourself permission to fail and pull your dreams of really being a contribution in the world toward you like nothing else you've ever done. Because not only is there a lot more happiness on the other side of that conversation, there's a lot more longevity, you know, because happy people who are being a high contribution to the world are way lower stress and they live a lot longer and they much have much happier family lives and uh, much happier um, senior years, you know. So dive in and, and have fun. Mm -hmm. Well, Teresa, thank you very much for hanging out with us today. It's much appreciated. Well, it's just my joy, Ken, and, uh, and thank you for your patience with all the background noise here in the hub of Costa Rica, um, but it really has been a joy to connect with you today. Thank you. Very good. Stay on the line, uh, Teresa. So Secrets of Success listeners, you've been listening to Teresa. We'll have all the sort of links and contact links for her around the mathinfluencethebook.com. You can go there, get that uh, free book from her and, you know, take the challenge. How can I influence and make a greater impact? And, you know, as always, we thank you for giving us your most valuable commodity and that is your time. So if you like what we're doing, Please pass it on, share it, let other people know about it, or leave a positive comment somewhere in whatever platform you're interacting with. So thank you again for listening. I'm your host, Dr. Ken Keyes. Thanks for exploring the secrets of success with us. If you want to keep the momentum going, log on to crgleader.com. Scroll to the bottom and sign up for our inspirational emails. You can also take your success to the next level by following us on Facebook and Twitter and connecting with Ken on LinkedIn. We hope you have a great week and look forward to you joining us next time for the Secrets of Success podcast with Dr. Ken Keyes.